Alrighty. Um, welcome everybody to the, um, the keynote address for this year's North Carolina Conference on Latin American and Caribbean Studies. It is an immense honor and a pleasure to introduce to you Veronica Gago, a professor of political science at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and of sociology at the Instituto de Altos Estudios at the Universidad Nacional de San Martín. Professor Gago is a pillar of Argentina's intellectual community. She's a researcher on CONICET, the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas, a member of the Grupo de Investigación e Intervención Feminista, and a coordinator of the Claxo Work on Popular Economies. As you can probably gather from this professional profile, Professor is a model of an engaged intellectual. She is the founder of the independent uh, collective Limon, who was part of the militant research experience, Colectivo Situaciones, and is now a member of Neona Menos. In October 2015, she helped lead a massive work stoppage in Argentina, drawing participation from hundreds of thousands of workers across 38 locations in Argentina, all demonstrating against gender violence and particularly against feminicidio. The event inspires of solidarity demonstrations throughout Latin America and beyond. And the Neo Mamelos movement, which itself first appeared in 2015, grew out of a robust tradition of Argentine feminism and has mushroomed in subsequent years to galvanizing protests around the world. As if all of this activism were to Professor Gago has also managed somehow to remain a prolific and influential author. Indeed, her writing uh, to a broad range of, of audiences clearly is an extension of her incredible activism, activism. Here first encountered her work through the 2017 Duke University Press book, Neoliberalism from Below, Popular Pragmatics and Baroque Economies, a translation of her 2014 book, La Raison Neoliberal, Economias Barrocas y Pragmatica Popular, published by Tinta Limón. Last year, also published Feminist International, How to Change Everything, a translation of her 2014 book, La Potencia Feminista. And this year, Pluto Press will publish her co-authored book, A Feminist Reading of Debt, translated also from the Spanish. Along the way, she has also edited multiple anthologies, co-authored many works, actually including with Liz, who I see was on the, on the call here, um, and, uh, and published in a wide array of periodicals from peer-reviewed journals such as South Atlantic Quarterly and Rethinking Marxism to magazines such as she maintains a profile as a deeply analytical, public-facing intellectual. And I, I'm going to, once I'm done with the introduction and I've handed it over to Professor Gago, I'm going to put in the chat for you. Uh, it's not even a full listing of all of her many publications, but the ones that are most relevant here. It's such an impressive uh, list and range of publications and a really, I think, for many of us, deeply influential. For over two decades, Professor Gago explored the relationship feminism and the left, particularly the Marxist left, reviving questions about social and feminist political economy. Cognizant of the long history in which feminist struggles, such as those for autonomy, equal distribution of labor burdens, and gender violence, have been subsumed within leftist struggles and, per and persistently deferred until after an anticipated and prioritized victory, Professor Gago has formed a crew of building a feminism rooted in the global south and knitting diverse feminisms struggling against various forms of precarity and social injustice. Her work on all fronts, the scholarship, the activism, the intellectual organizing is galvanizing, inspiring, and thought-provoking. And I'm very much looking forward to her keynote lecture this evening, Feminist Struggles in Latin America, Temporalities of Revolt. So please join me in offering a warm, if unfortunately virtual welcome to Professor Veronica Gago. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I would like to thank Natalie Hartman for the invitation and Jocelyn for your kind, kind uh, presentation. 
but also to Liz Mason Dees uh, for her work of translation. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here at the 2021 North Carolina Conference on Latin American Studies. I would prefer to be in person because I see nobody now, but um, it's, it's for me very uh, important to, to share today. The title of the conference is Engaging Latin American Realities. And I assume that the feminist movement in our region is one of the most significant forces of engagement in many ways. In that sense, I would like to address some features of the feminist movement in the present time, which I argue enables us to understand the singularity of a new cycle of feminist struggles. I want to share this short video previously as a soundtrack from my lecture. There is a feminist crowd or multitude chanting, down with patriarchy is going to fall, is going to fall, up with feminism is going to win, is going to go to victory. So this is just uh, an image and a, and a sound that I would like to, to share. So the, the first point that I, I would like to, to address is reframing machista violence from the streets. I think this is one of the, the, the main points that I would like to uh, develop. In 2015, the first Nuna Menos, or Not One Woman Less demonstration was organized in Argentina, not only to protest femicide, but to make it a priority on the country's political agenda. Femicide had reached alarming rates in the last years as a result of the intensification of neoliberal forms of violence that have translated into more violence against women, lesbian, trans, and non-binary people. Since then, the Nuna Menos movement has been developing a political process that politicized machista violence, understanding it as a result of the interconnection of violences, economic and financial violence, institutional violence, environmental violence, violence of drug trafficking, symbolic violence, the violence of exclusion, lack of access to the land, to proper housing, to public education, to health care and social services. What do I mean by politicize? I mean building a feminist pedagogy about how this violence is produced, going beyond the isolated scene of the femicide and the necropolitical counting of bodies in order to understand it, but also to fight against it. That implies another shift, politicizing femicide has enabled us to go beyond the mere victimization of women. Along that line, Argentina's first national women's strike was organized in October 2016, calling into question not only patriarchy, but also neoliberalism. And more precisely, the connection between the two. The expanded scope of the protest expressed the movement's framing of violence against women, lesbian, trans, and non-binary people, not as an accident, but as a central, central feature of capitalist accumulation. As such, this strike became the appropriate political and conceptual tool to combat this web of violence. The October strike was the first women's strike in the history of Argentina and Latin America. A strike was called for one hour in all the country, in all possible spaces, workplaces, educational spaces, domestic spaces, neighborhood. Trade unions, political parties, and feminist organizations immediately took part in the organization of the strike, and the following mobilization was enormous. Latin, Latin America was connected through the strike call. Using the tool of the strike allowed for highlighting the economic fabric of patriarchal and colonial violence. 
we, and I said we in a very wide sense, position ourselves as political subjects and producers of value. We complicated the category of workers and made it clear that work is also domestic work and informal work and includes forms of self-managed association, what is called in Spanish, trabajo autogestión. As the slogan, ni una menos, has already been taken up in various Latin American countries, the strike mobilization where, and the mobilization in October were quickly replicated in connection with the Argentinian call and the demands of each country against patriarchal and colonial violence. The second point is how this implies a reinvention of the strike. The month that followed saw a series of massive feminist demonstrations around the world, including the Women's March in the US. The momentum they created culminated in the organization of the first international women's strike in 55 countries on March 8, 2017. In January, the Nuna Menos Collective launched its own call to strike. This manifesto was nourished based on concrete situations and struggles and linked to the construction of a dynamic that demands systematic changes. We committed ourselves not only to virtual coordination, but also to weaving a new fabric body to body and industries. We open up dialogues, dialogues and engage in everyday work of constructing alliances with all the countries of Latin America and with other parts of the world. But what does the feminist strike mean? What is at stake in the redefinition of a strike is the redefinition of a powerful form of struggle in a new historical moment. Against a narrow model of the strike as masculine, white, wage, unionized, we are practically expanding its political scope. How could different kinds of bodies, territories, and conflicts be rethought from the point of view of the feminist strike? I think that this question is a research question. What does it mean strike in each situation? And this research question, in the midst of the crisis accelerated by the pandemic, demands a critical updating. I propose the feminist strike as a practical cartography of the feminist politics that is taking the street massively since five years ago. And I argue that the strike enables the feminist movement mobilized by the broad statement, ni una menos, vivas, libres, desendeudadas nos queremos, we want ourselves alive, free and without debt, to go beyond victimization and to become radical, massive and grounded in very different social conflicts. But also the feminist strike is a lens for understanding the reconfigurations of capitalism, its specific modes of exploitation and extraction of value, and the dynamics that resist, sabotage, and confront them. So the strike function functions as a practical force of intelligibility to problematize the broad terrain of work from the point of view of non recognized workers, informal workers, and unionized workers trying to go beyond the patriarchal practices in their unions. All these became a political weapon during the pandemic. Without the politicization of care, without activism to dedicate it to making unpaid reproductive work visible, without the denunciation of public and private indebtedness, without anti-extractivist struggles defending territories from being looted by corporations, without all the struggles producing these practices and vocabularies, 
we would not have been able to create this diagnosis in the way we have done so during the pandemic. So I think that the temporality of the pandemic connects with the feminist revolt in a very specific way, producing a sense of expansion of the programmatic issues that are unfolding with the feminist struggle. My first, my sorry, my third uh, point is how to conquest a mass dimension. This expansion of feminism in multiple spaces, temporalities, and scales gives rise to a mass feminism in Spanish, feminismo de masas, which has been an important dimension of the feminist movement's new impetus in recent years. This dimension is connected to its unprecedented force in generating mobilizations capable of occupying streets, plazas, cities, simultaneously in different places in the world. It is able to make these mobilizations last in time, not as isolated events, but rather as a political process that seeks its own forms of political accumulation, areas of rest and changes of pace, and its own dates to elaborate, to a collective elaboration. These massive mobilizations are not spontaneous, but rather the effect of an enormous amount of political work, a rage that finds express expressive force and a constant problematization of everyday praxis. It is also the effect of a political intelligence that takes care to nourish this massive and transnational dimension and produce duration in time. The mass multitudinous majoritarian dimension affirms, I think, a revolutionary dimension also because it is effectively confirms a capacity to affect that is not produced to small groups because it cannot be confined to particular sectors. It makes the expansiveness into a concrete form of politics, since we know that the conditions in which the majorities li live are the most cruel. Then the fact that feminism plays a prominent role in the political images of massiveness indicates a revolutionary component due to its force of interpolation, its capacity to produce an experience of subjectivation for new generations, and its organis organis oh, sorry, organizational formula that enables coordination across a large scale and between different conflicts and temporalities. But also because this massiveness is a filigree of actions, calls, discussions, assemblies, coordinations, all of which produces a density of time and a, a sort of overlapping of temporalities. In this back and forth, the relationship between the mass level and vectors of minoritarian struggles is conjugated in a new way. The minoritarian understood as a political composition that disregards subject of revolution that were historically considered legitimate, take takes on a mass scale as a vector of radicalization within this transfeminist tide. Thus, it challenges the neoliberal machinery of the recognition of minorities and pacification of difference. But massiveness is also elaborated based on issues that tend to be neglected or ignored when massiveness is only conceived in numerical quantitative terms or by its homogeneous and flattening force. My fourth point is about this 
feminist pedagogy about violence. What is it that becomes massive in this collective experience of showing up with our bodies on the streets? I would say that one of the elements is the specific characterization of neoliberal violence, which in turn can be understood as a key element of the feminist movement's internationalism. This characterization of neoliberal violence occurs in a concrete form based on everyday experiences of colonial disposition, precarization, and exploitation that allow for understanding how these forms of violence operate in direct connection with sexist violence. I see this as a reading of the totality of these violences, uh, a systematic reading, which at the same time is comprehensible from the position of everyday life. I think it's important how the feminist struggles connect this double level all the time, this systematic reading of violences from the point of view of the everyday experience. This encourages feminist initiatives to define themselves as anti-neoliberal, but not only as an ideological affirmation, but based on a concrete practice of identifying the frontiers where the battle against capitals advance take place. That is, it shapes the confrontation against the privatization of pensions, for example, against household debt, against cut to public services, against wage cuts, in relation to the way in which violence is co-produced against certain bodies marked by their gender and race. This not only provides concrete content to the anti-neoliberalism of feminist initiatives, but it also challenges the neoliberal Vulgate itself, in which competition is considered an anthropological mutation, and therefore there is not outside to the omnipresent governmentality. If today neoliberalism needs to ally with reaction, reactionary conservative forces from white supremacy to religious fundamentalism, from the colonial unconsciousness to the most uh, uh, brutal financial dispossession to quote Sueli Rolnik and also Wendy Brown, for example, it is because the destabilization of patriarchy and racist authorities put the accumulation of capital itself at risk. Right there, feminism exhibit their capacity to revive antagonism and conflict because they attack the structure of subordination and exploitation in a very sensitive and strategic area, precisely where neoliberalism is articulated with reactionary forces of the order of the family, sexuality, merit requirements of, for social subsidies, expectation of unpaid labor, and anti-migrant legislation. The other point that I would like to address is this idea of transversalization as strategy, this capacity of a current feminism to produce new kind of political alliances. I think this characterization of neoliberalism is neither abstract nor merely analytical because it also enables a big capacity or of, sorry, political alliances in which the feminist dynamic contaminates and expands into other struggles. This feminist dynamic spans not simple as a sector or a specific sets of demands, but rather transforms other struggles in their very way of making demands, of organizing protests by expanding the subjects who are involved. I'm not only thinking about how the front line, for example, of the protest in Chile has taken 
responsibility for care and a true infrastructure for the reproduction of the revolt, also thinking in the theorization of care of Jocelyn, but also the experience of young women disarming bombs in Peru in the last crisis in November, or the way in which feminist diagnosis of the pandemic crisis in Argentina has sustained the demand for abortion, for legal abortion, as an urgent need. All these uh, images are images of different kinds of struggles that are reconfigured by the, this feminist atmosphere, by this feminist vocabulary, but also this feminist way of doing politics. I think that there are concrete effects to discussing neoliberal violence as a political question that allows for connecting, mapping, and therefore identifying how violence is drawing on Sylvia Federici uh, conceptualization, how violence is a productive force of the first order in moments of pre-configuration of primitive accumulation. During this crisis accelerated by the pandemic, Lucy Caballero and I have spoken of property violence, precisely because property is rendered visible as a border that crosses each conflict and which becomes more clear in the pandemic. We pointed out that this battle seems to be concentrated in the territories of social reproduction, in the concrete infrastructures of care and social reproduction, ranging from housing to health services, from food monopolies to access to pensions, and over command of future labor that household debt seeks to control. In turn, we also see how in the crisis, in this crisis, the division between those who own property and those who don't is deepened through logics of the family, which have been strongly questioned in favor of the construction of feminist specialities. This feminist revolution, and I would like to use and propose this term, has posed a challenge to property by specificing the question of what the property apparatus means for the bodies of women, lesbian, trans, and non-binary, and those with the capacity to also uh, be involved in this kind of struggles. It seems to me that also the debate about legal abortion is not confined, but rather it connects to a debate about property that is broader and that effectively bring us to think and experiment with other non-extractive forms of relating with bodies and territories. This battle over property can be seen in the concrete demand for common and public use of goods and services that make the personal and collective reproduction of life possible or not. With reproduction made visible as a strategic sphere over which neoliberal dispossession and household debt takes place, the socialization of its means and resources has emerged as a common element of struggle at a global level. And also it is a statement for the next uh, feminist strike, the socializations of reproduction means. Then the lines of confrontation opened up, become legible to a large degree due to the feminist dynamic of politicizing the sphere of reproduction, which is identified as the war loot for neoliberal violence. Who do public services belong to? The production of food and medicine, housing, what are the current threats to public education? Who do the large fortunes belong to? What debts are being created and what tax reforms are necessary in the crisis? Furthermore, had we not been discussing how private property of bodies and territories entails a certain sexual order, thus the big question about who is going to pay for the crisis today is 
directly linked to the discussion about property that I think is forged in a new way by feminist movements. The next point is how we can go further with this practical updating of the notion of class that I think the feminist strike unfolds. Rather than opposing identity versus class or oppression versus exploitation, forms that are often used to try to confine and limit current struggles, the feminist revolts express, mobilize, and circulate a, a change sorry, in the working classes and what is understood by work, overflowing its classification and its hierarchies. Feminism brings the dimension of class into play when they speak of reproductive labor, whether the bodies and territories that are attacked by the violence of extractivist appropriation or through the practice of the feminist strike. This does not mean replacing and doing away with the question of exploitation, but rather rethinking how the exploitation is organized based on an understanding of gender mandates and racist privileges as part of an inseparable triangle of capital, patriarchy, and colonialism, to use an image from Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar. Several analyses point to a new articulation between patriarchy and capitalism that is expressed as a new articulation between production and reproduction that is orientating the mutation of neoliberal capitalism. Therefore, it is key to add the financial dimension to the analysis of social reproduction that feminism has been insisting on for decades. Because finance is a concrete mechanism in which morality and exploitation are not together, but also because it is the plane on which the global market accelerates disputing the temporalities of revolt. In Latin America, the indebtedness of household economies, non-waged economies, economies historically considered unproductive, understood from a feminist regarding of debt, allows for understanding how financial apparatuses as operate as, sorry, through mechanism for extracting value for confining lives and assigning tasks according to gender mandates, following the logic of a reinvigorated process of colonization. The features of the recomposition of what is traditionally called the labor conflict outside of its so-called normal coordinates enables us to think about how the expansion of the financial system is, on one hand, a response to a specific sequence of struggles, and on the other hand, a dynamic of contention that organizes a certain experience of the current crisis that attempts to capture futures. This perspective also allows us to understand how the mass indebtedness of populations of especially pure population, migrant populations, feminized populations, requires a specific type of disciplining and eventually criminalization. It is another way of characterizing the labor question from a feminist perspective today and of understanding forms of exploitation in the neoliberal moment. Taking this idea of uh, feminist reading of debt. Here, um, what I think is also at stake is a precise understanding of how the subjectivation of the masses deployed in the feminist revolt and especially through the feminist strike is a key component of the battle against neoliberalism, neoliberalism tendency to infinitely mutate and in this sense, confront its 
utopian financial infinity. It's idea of no never ending financial infinity. I think that all this allows us also to think in a new internationalism. It is also the transnational dimension of communist revolution, its capacity to combine diverse tendencies, intensities, and movements on a global scale, scale sorry, that embodies the possibility of a new internationalism. We know that coordinating is hard work, but worth the effort. That the synthesis that we are seeing in that in those years of actions, concepts, demands that are being reached have programmatic content. And this programmatic content emerges from the revolt and its political imagination, and also open up the temporally temporality, sorry, of struggles once again. How do continue to emphasize that sexist violence cannot be understood without economic violence? How do we suspend the extraction of rents, financial rents, real estate rents, agrarian rents of the transnational agribusiness corporations responsible for the ecological collapse? What capacity for reappropriation of collective wealth are being developed? How do we sustain a speciality of struggles that is simultaneously local and national and that has a transnational impact? In the saga of the feminist strikes, these questions have been taking shape and density. And today, faced with the current crisis, they become more urgent. My last point is how about these feminist struggles uh, to rethink or to reformulate the relationship between struggles and institutions. I think this is a big issue that would be enough for a whole intervention in itself, but I want to focus on what I consider to be an especially useful concept, the revolutionary real politic, which we can take from Rosa Luxemburg and particularly as rescued by the German author, Fria Hau. It is a way of linking everyday transformations with a horizon of radical change in a movement here and now of mutual implication in a politics from below. This presents us with the need to continue developing the relation in concrete processes, making collective balance sheets, evaluating where to push the dispute in each place. Thus, the teleology of the final objective as a precise temporality is displaced, but not because it stops existing or it's weakened but rather because it enters into another temporal relation with everyday politics, filling every concrete and specific action with that revolutionary dynamic. Opposition becomes complementary in terms of the radicalization of a concrete politics that feminists are carrying out on the streets, in beds and in homes, but also in workplaces but it also creates strategic temporality, which is the deployment of the movement in the present. It managed to work within existing contradictions without waiting for the appearance of absolutely liberated subjects, nor ideal conditions for struggle, nor placing its trust in a single space that would totalize social transformation. It appeals to the potential of rupture, rupture, the power of rupture of each action and does not limit the rupture to a final spectacular moment of strictly evolutionary accumulation. This adds another density to the notion of feminism as everyday revolution because it disputes how the orientation of each crisis is determined 
determined by concrete practices. And in that register, it gives us a clue for feminist politics, a politics that cannot be other than a, than a vitalist pragmatics, desiring to revolutionize everything and therefore with the capacity to reinvent realism. A revolutionary real politic capable of combining different political temporalities. For example, in 2018, against the backdrop of this national, regional and global feminist effervescence, Argentina's feminist movement made the decision to concentrate its efforts on the legalization of abortion. This decision grew out of the movement's articulation of the right to abortion, not only as a legal demand, but also as a part of a broader political discourse. Legal abortion was framed as the central battle in the fight for autonomy with the female and a body as one of the many territories to be liberated. From the perspective of work, legal abortion was presented as an avenue for escaping unwanted pregnancies that condemn women to the domestic confines of unpaid labor. From a legal perspective, it freed women, women from the false alternative of maternity or prison, or prison, sorry, and the criminalizations of women's decision making capacity as subject of desire and right. From the perspective of capital accumulation, women would no longer be reduced to being producers of cheap labor. Finally, we had a victory last December with the legalization of abortion on demand, on free legal abortion. The struggle, of course, is not over. Feminist organizations are demanding that women who have been imprisoned for having abortions prior to its legalization be released from prison. They will also remain on the feminist network, remain vigilant to make sure that the law is fully implemented. In the context of the unprecedented economic crisis due to the pandemic, especially in Argentina, they are also concerned about maintaining public funding for public health care and education. This victory in Argentina also resonates across the region. Feminist movements in Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru and Mexico are especially eager to make their countries the next to join to the green tide. That also revitalized the transnational feminism, which continues pushing against conservative and neoliberal forces. Now, just to finish, in preparation for the next March 8, faced with the social, economic and health crisis, the feminist strike will be multiple again, mapped in different scales. And we ask again, what does it mean to stop destructive machine against our bodies and territories? The feminist movement has different rhythms, moments and intensities, but as the crows of the feminists continue to sing and to chant loudly, America Latina va a ser toda feminista. All of Latin America will be feminist. Thank you very much.